Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me on the microphone? Yeah, okay. Very good, very good. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say I am so excited to be here at Pine Valley 2021. Praise God for this opportunity that we have, especially given the past 14 months that, that we've had. I'm just so excited to be here, and I want to <clears throat> excuse me, express my, my appreciation to many of you who have prayed for me, uh, not only in the preparation for the word that's going to go out this, this evening, but also for my health and for my voice. Uh, I'm very thankful to God for each and every one of you. Before we begin this evening's, this evening's worship service, I ask you to please pray with me and pray for me. Our holy, heavenly Father, Lord, it is with humility that we have gathered here this evening around your holy word. Father, not because we are even worthy to worship you, but Father, because you are good and you are worthy to be praised. Father, please bless the weakest of thy servants who speaks. Father, please fill me with the Holy Spirit this evening, that as the message would go forth, that many eyes would be opened, Father, to the truth of your holy and living word. Please open each heart, convict each heart that's here, beginning with my own and extending out to each and every soul that sits in a chair in this room. Father, we pray for thy presence and blessing in this evening, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so I'd like to um, preface, before we get started, before we look into a couple of passages, we're going to be reading a couple of different passages. Before we start, I'd like to preface by saying, I, I'd like to dispel a notion, I'll say. I am not... A, an instructor or a professor that's speaking to students as if I have mastered something that now I am passing on to you. That is not what this series is going to be about this Pine Valley weekend. Actually, I am just a humble brother of yours who is on this journey with you because God laid on my heart a very convicting message for this evening, extending all the way to tomorrow night and I'd like to lay it out for you, lay out a roadmap. But before I do, I would like to explain where, my, where, the, where God has been taking my mind um, as I've been preparing for this message. And so I'd like to do something that's a little bit unorthodox. And so please bear with me here. Because I could use words to explain what I saw. But I would like to show you instead. And so I'd like to play a three-minute video for you. I want you to see something. As I was preparing for this message and as I was contemplating what the Apostle Paul was going through in Acts chapter 9 when he was on the road to, Dam to Damascus and when he was um, struck by a blinding light and when he could not see and when the Lord opened his eyes, not only physically but also spiritually, right? This is a metaphor for the, the conversion that was happening in Paul. I would like for you to see something that I saw and I have a, a video that I'd like to play just to explain a little bit. You are going to see two young girls, their sisters, who are, have a genetic condition and they were blind since birth. And they go through a medical operation and you are going to see what it's like when their eyes are opened for the first time. And I want you to pay attention when you see this to someone's eyes physically being opened for the first time. Before we play it, can, can somebody please kill the lights so that we have a little bit better view and then let's go ahead and, and watch this video. Please pay attention to that moment. The <laughs> ये हमारा बच्चा ना देखते भाई वो तो दिन इसको देखते भाई नहीं जेल तो पार बन खटा खट में करे जो घर कोते पार बने आरो तो टकाई फिरो पसंद कोते पार बने I'm 
দেখতে পাই গেলে তো খুব আমি মনে করব যে খুব ভালো লাগে ইউ नीड মোর অফ হার্ট দ্যান ইওর হ্যান্ড ইন ডুইং সার্ভিস ফর চিলড্রেন অনিতা এন্ড সোনিয়া কাম फ्रॉम এ ভেরি পুয়ার ফ্যামিলি ইফ দে আর নট অপারেটেড দে রিমেইন ব্লাইন্ড ফর লাইফ এন্ড হোয়াট হ্যাপেন্স ইন মোস্ট অফ দ্য কেসেস they are used by the family as beggars ব্যান্ডেজটা খুলে দেয় সে ছুটে নামে আর এমনিতে বলে মা আমি দেখতে পাচ্ছি দেখতে পাচ্ছি তাদের ভবিষ্যৎ যেন ফিরে আসে সেটাই তো চাই মা বাবা বলো থ্যাংক ইউ ক্যান সামান প্লিজ টার্ন অন দ্য লাইটস catch that moment when they could first see just uh, especially the the older sister just the look on her face as she saw for the first time you know when i contemplated this theme open my eyes lord i thought to myself what does this mean the the bible uses this metaphor not once not twice but like dozens of times and in so many different types of ways and i thought to myself well what does this metaphor mean like open my eyes why for what purpose and when i saw this this video and i saw somebody actually being able to see for the first time it became very clear to me that young woman's life was going to be changed forever it was never going to be the same the life that she had before was dramatically different than the life she was going to have now and this entire idea of having our eyes opened has everything to do about change and so the message for this weekend is actually going to be on this word on this word change now i know the word change is a loaded word and i know it gives people a lot of different emotions I understand some people view the idea of change as something that's neutral. Kind of like you're replacing, you're rotating the tires on your car, you're making a change. It doesn't really have, you know, much impact on your life, you know, one way or the other, right? Some people view change as something that's that's good and beautiful because they think of change as 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 a tree that's beginning to to blossom or bloom and this tree is going through a beautiful change and it's producing something that it didn't have before. And yet more people still when they hear the word change they they have a negative taste in their mouth 
because they think of, of a change that is bitter, maybe the loss of a loved one that's going to change the dynamic of your family or your relationship, and it's something to be avoided. You know, change can be any of these things. It can be neutral, it can be positive, it, it can be negative as well. And this entire sermon, and not today only, but throughout the rest of the weekend, is going to center around this word change, but maybe not in the way you may think. So please bear with me, stick with me here. I would like to give you a roadmap of the message both this evening and also for the rest of the weekend so you can know what to expect. The theme for Pine Valley 2021 is Open My Eyes, Lord. Asking God to give us an eye-opening experience. But for what? We know the purpose. There's no reason to have your eyes open and not change. James, uh, I think it's chapter 1, talks about a man who looks in a mirror, and then after he sees himself in the reflection, he turns and he walks away as if he never saw himself. There's no change that took place. Even though he was able to see himself, he turns around and there's no change. What is the point of having our eyes open if there is not going to be a transformation? There has to be something that arises from having our eyes open. And in scripture, this is always centered around having a different perspective, a changed perspective, a changed behavior, a change of attitude, a change in our actions, or a change in all of the above. And so, again, this theme verse opened my eyes, Lord. I, the Lord led me to three sub-themes that, are intentionally, that intentionally have the sequence that they do. This evening's theme is going to be Open my eyes, Lord, to my sin and your holiness. Open my eyes, Lord, to my sin and your holiness because it has to start there. Every change must start there. Tomorrow morning, the theme is going to be open my eyes, Lord, to the spiritual reality around me. Now, that sermon is going to be, that message is going to be focused on a personal change to how we view the world around us. Rather than viewing it so through such a physical lens for us to start viewing it through eternity, for us to start viewing it through something that actually has lasting value or that matters. And the last sermon, the third one, is going to center around the theme, open our eyes, Lord, to your will for your church, which now becomes a collective opening of eyes, a collective change, but it must begin here. It must begin with me. And so I'd like to look at the theme for this evening, Open My Eyes, Lord, to my sin and your holiness. And if you will turn with me, we'll turn to our first text this evening, which is found in 2 Samuel chapter 12. So if you will turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're going to begin reading with verse number 1. <clears throat> And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, so now this is Nathan talking to David. He says, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup, and it lay in his bosom, and it was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art that man. Thus the Lord God of Israel, thus saith, excuse me, the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, 
I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with a sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house because thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes and give them unto thy neighbor. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. So now David responds. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. And I'd like to stop right there. Okay, so we may be familiar with this chapter, right? King David, a man who was granted this title in the scripture, and I believe Jesus even called David this, a man after God's own heart. You know, if I could have that title, I don't believe I am worthy to hold that title, a man after God's own heart. David was given this title, And yet, when we walk into this chapter, we see that David had somehow fallen into this place where he had abused his own power as a king to seduce another man's wife and to have sexual relations with her while her husband was at war for him. And then he has to clean up his mess and he calls the man back home because his Bathsheba is now pregnant, and he wants to try to conceal this. And without going into, back into those scriptures, Uriah resists going back to his house and completely just foils David's plan to hide his sin. Uriah takes the high ground after the king, who should know better, commits this grave sin. So David still has to conceal his sin somehow, right? So he sends Uriah with his own death sentence with a letter to take to the general that basically says, put this man, the guy who just gave you this letter, on the front lines at the hottest battle. And so that's what happened. And Uriah dies. David thinks, my problems are solved. Right? I cleaned up this mess. It's all well and good. Now I could take Bathsheba to be my wife. No one will be the wiser. You see, there's something that David somehow forgot. He somehow forgot that God could see what was happening the entire time. He somehow forgot that God's eyes are not blind. That God can see our sin. How is it that David had fallen so far? I mean, how is this possible? If we take a step back and we look at everything that's happened in David's life until this point, right, when he was put into the kingship, he had fought many battles, he had been victorious, he had conquered all of his enemies. At this point, the problem with David is that he's full of pride. David is full of pride. And the proverb that says that pride cometh before destruction and haughtiness before the fall had not yet been written, but this proverb was well known, David should have known this, but he was now proud. He was resting on his victories, and he had somehow lost sight of the fact that he too could fall so far. Now, when David is is addressed by Nathan, who points out his sin, David says, I have sinned. I have sinned against the Lord. Do you think David was just confessing his guilt because he was caught? I mean, is this a genuine picture of repentance here? 
the, the key is that Nathan tells him that God has already forgiven you. God has already put away your sin. Now, David did not deserve this kind of mercy. David, according to the law, deserved to die. There was no exception in the law for a king to be able to do these things. And yet, David did not receive death. He received mercy from the Lord because he repented in this moment, something that the Lord knew was going to happen. But what it took for his eyes to be open to his sin was it took something hitting him like a ton of bricks when Nathan had to confront him about his sin. I'd like to read what, another passage. If you will go with me now to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to look at another picture, another example here. Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to begin reading with verse number 1. <clears throat> In the year that King Uzziah died, this is Isaiah speaking now about a vision he saw. I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this, has, this hath touched thy lips. And thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. So here Isaiah sees a vision. He's standing in the throne room of God. And he sees the glory of God and he trembles. Because in this moment, when he sees the holiness of God and when he sees this image, he is so acutely aware of his sin. He is so aware of his sin. The first thing that he says is, woe unto me. I am undone. I am a sinner. I have unclean lips. But because he recognizes his sin, because he recognizes his sin and he confesses it, he is purified. The coal is placed on his tongue, and he is purged and ready for the master's use. You know, in John chapter 9, when Jesus healed a man that was born blind, and after this whole ordeal where the Pharisees are trying to untangle this messy web of, you know, wait, ho hold on, who healed you? Who is this person? How did it happen? Tell us again. Now we're going to go ask your parents, because they just can't seem to wrap their minds around what has happened. Later, after all of this is done, Jesus has this interaction with them. In verse number 39, Jesus says to them, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see might not see. Sound familiar? It's exactly what we read in Isaiah chapter 6. And that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees that were with him, they heard these words, and they said unto him, Are we blind also? Now, Please catch the irony here. Jesus had just healed a man that was born blind. The Pharisees were struggling to untangle this mess. They didn't believe him. They kick him out of, you know, they basically excommunicate him, if you could say it that way, from the, um, from the, the religious establishment. And now they're asking Jesus, saying, are we blind? Jesus says this to them. He says, if you were blind, 
you would have no sin. But now you say, we see. You think you can see. And therefore, your sin remains. That's amazing. If we think we can see, we're blind and our sin remains. But if we understand that we are blind and that we have sin, then there is opportunity for forgiveness. You see, it wasn't until the moment that Isaiah confessed his sin and understood that he had sin in his life that he was purified. And only then he was prepared to be an ambassador for the Lord. So I, I want to stop and I want to make a significant point here. Okay? This is why this message has to be the first one. Because before Isaiah could be sent to be an ambassador for the Lord, he had to see his sin and he had to be purified of his sin. Before you and I can begin to see the spiritual reality around us, we have to be able to see our sin. We have to be able to understand the holiness of God. We have to be purged and purified from our sin. And this is not a one-time event in your life. This is not a one-time event in your life. Only then can we be prepared to see the spiritual reality around us. Only then can we actually start talking about the church, the third message, the collective. We all love to talk about the collective. We all love to have lengthy conversations about how the church needs to change. And the reality is, the hard conversation about how I need to change, about how my eyes need to be opened, they're so easily set aside. Because that's, that's the difficult conversation to have. So what are some sins that Christians are often blind to in this present age? I jotted a few things down here. So aside from, first of all, the utter disregard for sin, I, 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 um, I love Christian apologetics. And I, and I love listening to people who are much wiser than I answer some very difficult questions, right? I once heard a, a, an apologetic. He was taking questions from an audience, and there was a young woman who asked him this question. She said, is it possible to love Jesus but to disagree with him? Is it possible? Can I love Jesus but disagree with him? And he kind of laughs and says, you know, this is a hard question. Like, I guess it's possible to love somebody and disagree with them. Like, well, you could do that with a parent. He said, but God is not your parent. He is not your equal. And he made this comment. He said, Christians today need to stop saying, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I disagree with him on marriage. I disagree with him on sexuality. I disagree with him on, you know, this topic and that topic. Stop, stop calling yourself a Christian. You cannot be a follower of Christ and yet disagree with the one you're following. You can't do that. You simply can't do that. It doesn't make any sense. So let's set that aside because I, I don't believe that's true of anybody here. Glor glorification and gratification of self. Glorification and gratification of self. I'd like to share with you a personal testimony Something that I don't think I've shared with too many people. After I was converted, there was a sin in my life that, frankly, I was blind to for a long time. You see, I love to sing. And I love to make music to God. But I also have a competitive spirit. And I also was struggling with secret pride. And for many years, even after I converted... For some reason, when I heard other people go up and they were going to sing a song or they were going to, you know, do a special number or whatever, there was something inside me that secretly wanted them to just make a little mistake. Sounds kind of funny, right? Something just, I just wanted them to just not do that great. 
For some reason, I wanted to do a, you know, a, a, a standout job. I wanted to do an amazing job. I didn't want someone else to like be on my level. And um, it was so subtle, but it was in my heart that for, for quite a few years, I didn't really realize it was there until this moment, this one moment, that God convicted me of this sin that I was blind to. And I don't remember where I was. I don't remember when it happened. But I had a King David moment where I realized that that was so wrong. And that, was, that wasn't like, oh, that's a mistake or a shortcoming or whatever other you know, cute little word you want to use. That was an absolute sin. Because I wanted the glory for myself. I would have never told you that. But if I wanted someone else to not do as good of a job as me, and I wanted to be the best, because this prideful, competitive spirit was coming out, I mean, that was just a sin that I had to repent from. And God opened my eyes to that, and I repented from that. And today, I couldn't be a bigger cheerleader for the glory of God. Whenever somebody is put in a position of responsibility, whether it's preaching, whether it's singing a song, I mean, I am just praying that God is going to be glorified and that they are going to just do amazing and that it's going to touch hearts. And it's just, my heart changed. And maybe you can relate to something. Maybe there's something in your life or in my life that you and I are blind to. Like David, I think legitimately David was blind to his sin, and it wasn't until Nathan came up to him that he, just, he wasn't even aware. Justified animosity towards the brethren. Somehow coming up with a reason to hold a grudge. That's a sin. First John talks about that. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is... No stumbling in him. He that hates his brother is in darkness, walks in darkness, doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Knowing to do good but not doing them. We live in probably the most privileged time. I mean, more privileged than we've ever been in regards to our comfort, our convenience, our wealth, all of these things that we enjoy Taking pleasure in those who do evil things. Taking pleasure in those who do evil things. I don't do that, but I may take pleasure in watching someone else do that. And, and here's what I thought of. Conflating nationalism and kingdom citizenship. I mean, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. For some reason, throughout broader Christianity, there's such a conflation between American patriotism and kingdom citizenship, being a Christian. Those two things are not the same. Maybe they were more correlated you know, in years gone by than they are today, but Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom crosses borders and boundaries. I know time is, is going quickly, so I'm going to try to wrap it up here. When we spend time in the throne room of God, when we have that Isaiah 6 experience and we see the holiness of God, that opens our eyes to our sin. That puts my sin in its proper context. And you remember we talked about the word change when we said, open my eyes, Lord. Why? Why do I want my eyes open to my sin and the holiness of God? Because it's supposed to produce a change in my life. What is that change? That change is a repentant heart. And my friend, you might say, but I can't see God. I can't see God with my physical eyes. In Matthew chapter 9, Jesus is walking somewhere and there are two blind men that are following him. Two men that are physically blind. They can't see him. But they are crying out to him and they're saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. Well, hold on a second. You know, you might say, but I can't see God with my physical eyes. Well, I have an example here of two men who could not see Jesus with their physical eyes. They're crying out to Jesus for mercy. And when he was coming to the house, the blind man came to him. They kept following him. And Jesus said to them, believe ye that I'm able to do this to, to heal them. And they said unto him, yea, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it unto you. 
And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that thou tell no man. So, the irony. Here are two blind men who recognize the Messiah. Two blind men recognize the Messiah. Pretty much almost the entire um, Jewish religious leadership did not recognize their Messiah. I mean, I, I can't find a more ironic comparison to give you. When we recognize our Messiah, when our eyes are open to our Savior, he is there and he is ready and waiting to heal us. Open my eyes, Lord, to my sin and your holiness so that it would produce a change in my life, so that I would repent, so that I could be a vessel that's purged, purified, and ready for the master's use. Because Jesus is waiting to heal. I would like to um, read a, a beautiful poem by Myra Brooks Welch. I don't know who this is. Um, it's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. And it, it just so beautifully fits this theme. Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it was scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I to bid, good folk, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, now two, only two? Two dollars, and who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as an angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I to bid for the old violin as he held it up with the bow? A thousand dollars? And who'll make it two? Two, two thousand? And who'll make it three? Three thousand once? And three thousand twice? Three thousand and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some exclaimed, we do not quite understand what changed its worth. And the answer came, "'Twas the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with soul out of tune and battered and scarred by sin, is auctioned cheap by the thoughtless crowd just like the old violin. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. O oh, master, I am the tuneless one. Lay, lay thy hand on me. Transform me now, put a song in my heart of melody, Lord, to thee. There is a transformation that happens when we see our sin. When we see that sin that we've been hiding under the rug, or maybe buried deep into a dark closet somewhere where we don't want to face it like David had done, there is a change that is wrought when we confess our sin when our eyes are open to it, when we stand before the holy God. And I'd like to close by some verses that the same David wrote in Psalm 19. He said, who can understand his errors or his sins, my sins and yours? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. We're going to have a special number.
remembering my dad this very evening. That was his favorite poem, The Touch of the Master's Hand. As we close this evening's services, let's all bow our heads and hearts in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank thee for our Lord and Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, um, whom it was written and Jesus even read in the Old Testament in Isaiah, that this is he whom thou hast anointed with thy spirit to preach the good tidings to the meek, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty the captives, to open the prison bars and the doors, to set at liberty those who are bound and imprisoned, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of his judgment and vengeance, to give the oil of joy for sadness and mourning, to unstop the ears of the deaf, to un untangle and uncover the eyes of the blind, to make lame leap like deer. We're thankful for him, Lord, because were it not for his death and resurrection and his sending thy Holy Spirit to this earth to find a home in our hearts, we would be totally lost. Lord, this is that spirit, and is not this same Holy Spirit, Lord, here? Lord, you said where two or three are gathered in thy name with this desire to turn and repent and turn to thee, that there thou wouldst be in the midst of us, and is not thy spirit here, Lord? Will you not open the eyes of the blind? You will, and you will open the ears of the deaf. You will cause the day star to shine in our hearts, to lead us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Words cannot express, Lord, how thankful we are that you have gone this far to bring part of yourself down in the form of Jesus Christ, the son of a woman, the son of man, but sinless, to be obedient to the cross and to replace a judgment day of eternal hell with an eternal kingdom and life with you eternally forever and ever. We don't deserve this, Lord. Our lips are unclean, and we dwell in the people, amongst the people of unclean lips. But we know that thine arm is not too short to save. And you would have all men to be saved. We just need to have our eyes opened and our ears unstopped. We can't do it ourselves, Lord. This is thy spirit's work. And are we ready for change? That is a question I need to ask myself, and we need to ask ourselves. This is thy spirit, Lord, thy spirit of change. Lord, we confess that there's some inertia. None of us want to change. It's not in our nature, but this is where we need your help. And this is the Spirit's doing, the convincing, the convicting, the sanctification, the making of holy, the refreshing, and the renewing of our minds so that we can find it easier to not be conformed to this world and be transformed by the renewing of our minds through thy Holy Ghost. And thanks, Lord, so much. Thank you so much for bringing down thy Holy Spirit to make a change. Lord, it doesn't matter if we don't believe in you right now, this very minute. Those are un there are unbelievers amongst us. There are believers. There have been believers for many years. But we all need help. We all need to change in some way. We are all being sanctified. And we pray, Lord, that for the unbelieving, you would help them believe. For we who are believers, that you would help us to rip out that unconfessed sin and return to you the living God, who will help us to cross the finish line of this life into life eternal. We don't deserve your son, but Lord, we love you for this because you loved us first, that you gave him as a sacrificial present, a lamb unblemished, 
so that we could live life and live it eternally with you. For this, we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor for all that was said and done today in your name, for your glory, praise, reverence, honor, blessing. Bless us all today, this very weekend, with your Holy Spirit. Have him have free reign so that we can be changed and so we don't have to be worried about being naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And we pray this fervently and humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> so this will close our, our worship together for this portion. Um, I do want to remind everyone that Inspiration Hour will begin at 8.45, so please hurry on back. The snack bar, yes, the snack bar is open currently um, until Inspiration Hour begins at 8.45, so please be prompt. Thank you. <laughs>